to welcome you all in our uh, meeting today, uh, one of the uh, online courses hosted by Banha University of Fidic Department of Banha University. Uh, I'd like to welcome all my colleagues uh, who attended this meeting today. Dr. Ash have said that we have guest speakers from uh, UK, from uh, Canada, from uh, Brazil, from India, from Switzerland, and definitely our colleagues uh, from Egypt who are specialized in shoulder surgery. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure for all of us to meet uh, with, with a great number of attendees. Uh, Dr. Asha told me that uh, one of the orthopedic channels or one of the TV channels in India is uh, transmitting also our meeting today. It's a great pleasure for all of us to welcome our colleagues from India. Uh, uh, and uh, we can say that we, we uh, this uh, crisis or unprecedented crisis uh, uh, presented by COVID-19, we have taught a lot of lessons. One of the, uh, the one of the most important lessons we have taught in this crisis that how we can uh, help each other to turn the crisis into an opportunity. Uh, definitely, the virtual meetings uh, hosted at least by the orthopedic department in Banha University. Uh, uh, prove this is idea that we can meet in a great number, even if we cannot attend the great uh, events or great conferences, uh, uh, we can meet uh, not only in hundreds, but even in thousands of attendees or orthopedic surgeons. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all and uh, wishing you a fruitful uh, specialty day uh, uh, presented by uh, our colleagues from uh, specialized in shoulder surgery. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, and a great pleasure to meet you in our Orthopedic meetings. Thank you so much. Our blog professor, Professor Adel Adawi, the uh, president of the Egyptian Medical Association. Now we will come to the talk of Professor Gamal Hosni, the president of the Orthopedic uh, uh, Society of uh, the Orthopedic uh, Association of uh, Egypt. Uh, professor Gamal. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. Uh, Thank good you so evening, much. everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Egyptian Orthopedic Association, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mohammed Lashab, the Dean of the Banha Faculty of Medicine. And I would like to congratulate you for being appointed as the Dean of the uh, Banha University. And I wish you, thank you so uh, much. all the best in the, in the new term of, uh, 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 of uh, being the Dean of the uh, Banha University. Um, uh, I would like to thank the guest speakers from uh, uh, different countries we are going to uh, give their presentations today and tomorrow. And I would like to remind everybody with the activities, the recent activities of the Egyptian Orthopedic Association. Uh, the next Wednesday, we have the, our 17th International Deformity Conference. It's going to be a hybrid. Uh, in the morning from eight o'clock till 4 p.m., we are going to have face-to-face -face presentations. And then from half past four till Half past seven, we are going to have the virtual program. So it's a mixed program and for three days, and I would like to see all of you uh, uh, to participate in the, in the meeting. Uh, 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 we know in the Egyptian Orthopedic Association, we are always uh, encouraging the scientific activities, especially the online presentations and the, uh, uh, the online teaching programs. The most important of them are Banha mm -hmm. teaching program uh, developed by Professor uh, Mohammed Lashad. Online teaching came to stay. Whatever happened after us, after the end of the COVID-19 era, we are going to continue our online teaching uh, and virtual programs uh, because we find it's very fruitful for exchanging the ideas between different parts of the world. You know, we are all seeking for the um, improving the health and the uh, alleviating the pain of the patients. And this is not just in Egypt or in the Arabic countries, it's all over the world. So the, um, the doctors or the scientists have to exchange the ideas for the, uh, for the uh, healing the, 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 the problems and the diseases for uh, all over the world. So finally, I would like to thank Professor Mohammed. I would like to thank all our guest speakers, Dr. Mohammed Imam. Thank you for being with us this meeting. And uh, uh, let's start the meeting. And I hope it's going to be very fruitful. Thanks, Mohammed. 
Thank you so much, Professor Gamal Hosni, the president of the Egyptian Orthopedic Association. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, announcing officially for the beginning of the Shoulder Speciality Days. Our first speaker will be Professor Mohammed Imam from London East University. Uh, it's a great honor to be with us, Professor Mohammed. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, sir. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's mine, Dr. Mohammed and uh, Professor Mohammed, and thanks a lot to Professor Gamal and Professor Ladawi for opening this and for everyone. Uh, who are undertaking this uh, brilliant uh, sets of webinars, which has been very educational and informative for many surgeons all over the globe. And I've been told a uh, huge amount of uh, positive feedbacks from different uh, surgeons and trainees all over the globe. So I'm going to talk uh, in the next 20 minutes or so about rotator cuff disease. We're going to talk about 11 myths uh, debunked about uh, rotator cuff uh, disease. I'm a consultant from an upper limb surgeon at the Rolly Prosto Orthopedic Unit, and I'm a professor and medical director of the Smart Health Academic Unit at the University of East London. And it's always a pleasure to uh, uh, attend uh, and uh, attend these meetings organized by Ben uh, Depart uh, Orthopedic Department, as well as uh, prestigious uh, and one of the oldest uh, orthopedic associations in the world, the Egyptian Orthopedic Society. So, association. So, We've evolved a lot over the last hundred years. However, our shoulders didn't really evolve that much. So what the shoulder, what a 60 years old would do nowadays routinely wouldn't be even a possibility 20 or 40 years ago. And in order to approach these problems, we have to understand the complex nature of shoulders for sure. And we always have to approach these patients in a bespoke individualized pattern. So why I'm going to talk about rotator cuff disease? Because one, shoulder pain is the third most common presentation of musculoskeletal pain in primary care after neck and low back pain. And out of 9 million patients presenting with, who are older uh, over the, the age of 60, 60% 60 of them would have cuff disease. And with rotator cuff disease, and actually the majority of shoulder problems, we can diagnose almost 90% of the time just by history and examination. So having a holistic, comprehensive approach to these patients would enable us to identify the problem. So. What do we, know, we need to know? So a rotator cuff disease is actually a sequence of events, starting from subacromial impingement to calcific tendinosis, partial and full thickness tears, as well as cuff tear arthropathy. And one myth we always, uh, fe uh, I, we always see with patients is patients saying, my pain is actually in the arm, it's not in the shoulder. How come I have a rotator cuff problem? And actually 99% of these patients will have pain down the arm towards the deltoid muscle insertion. And that's usually the first question I would ask and recommend to ask when you have a patient with a shoulder pain. And we diagnose subacromial impingement with the three Ps, pain, painful arc syndrome, in which the pain is always between 60 and 100 degrees, and doing the provocative tests like near test and the Eukins and Hawkins tests. So important mess here that many do not really appreciate, especially in GP practice and some orthopedic surgeons, is that subacromial impingement in the majority of the cases are symptoms. It's not a disease in itself. So we have to understand first what is the rotator cuff. We have to understand that the rotator cuff are dynamic stabilizers for tendons. They have the, the main function of a comprehensive concavity, sorry, compression concavity function or the pumping action. So the rotator cuff tendons surround the humeral head as a baseball ground surrounding the baseball itself. And the main function is to keep the humeral head in front of the glenoid so that we can have the extensive range of motion in shoulders. And if there are any problems, then patients might have subacromial impingement. We have to understand the different anatomy we have compared with apes. We have in, in humans, the uh, clavicle is lens and the scapula moves to the back and the glenohumeral joint is externally rotated. 
And actually, impingement doesn't mean an acromial spare. We now understand that impingement can be a secondary symptom to three big categories, either postural, which is impingement by itself, all what is needed there is for the patient to correct their posture, or can be related to cuff dysfunction or a space occupying lesion. So acromial spare is actually one out of 10, but it can, all of these conditions, including cervical disc disease, can cause uh, problems, uh, either cuff dysfunction or space occupying lesion. And that's why two thirds of patients with shoulder pain will have positive impingement tests. One common problem to understand is the postural impingement. And that's actually has been extremely common nowadays with patients sitting, with all of us sitting on, on our laptops and desktops working and having weird postures. And that would lead to shoulder pain. And all what is needed here is actually a correction of the posture of patient in order to overcome the impingement lesion. And uh, you, in clinics, you can easily identify that by doing scapular assisted correction of the problem. And the pain usually improves significantly just by asking the patient to repeat the impingement tests with uh, correction of the posture. So advice to patients is all what is needed. A physiotherapy program for postural impingement would be more than enough. So if these patients have the three Ps and you do x-rays and you find calcifications, that's the second uh, bit of rotator cuff disease. It's very common nowadays. And uh, ultrasound guided needling and parpotage has significantly helped with this problem. And actually, this is one of my patients. Uh, we've done an aspiration, uh, an insertion of application of saline. And you can see you can aspirate a lot of the calcium out of uh, the shoulders. And actually, the interesting bit nowadays, mainly because of the advent of uh, ultrasound guided parpotage, the, the number of patients that we have to operate on and release the calcium has significantly decreased. And the success rate of parpotage is estimated to be around 70 to 75 and you can see that the draining the calcium is uh, not technically demanding, but and it is uh, uh, and it is really interesting what you can achieve. So, what about partial tears? We used to under to think that partial tears can be managed with steroid injections, but the more we understand about shoulders, the more we get the concept that actually. A steroid injection has the risk of possibly increasing the size of the tear. So if we manage it mainly now with physiotherapy or repair. And repair, there are two techniques uh, we originally talk about, either completion of the tear and repair. And some uh, uh, advocates of that technique would say because the tendon is not really of good quality. Second option is in situ repair. However, nowadays, my preferred option is actually doing uh, uh, biologic uh, graft. Uh, Regenitin, which is popularized by Smith and Nephew, and it's a quick procedure. The last one I've done a few days ago to, it would take less than 10, took less than 10 minutes actually inserting the graft, and the results are very promising uh, utilizing this technique, and we have uh, very promising results with uh, this uh, technique. And as I said, it doesn't take long. And actually recovery and rehabilitation after uh, this technique is very quick, uh, and uh, is, uh, we are observing very good uh, results so far. And the patients, we, I don't keep them in a sling, and we start mobilization as soon as we can. So. We know from the evidence, uh, paper published by Amanka that up to 80% of these would pro might progress to full thickness there. However, with the advent of uh, physiotherapy and uh, exercises, and uh, we understand things more, and we understand who to operate on and who to manage non-operatively, I think that is, uh, the figures has decreased significantly, and the recent evidence say it can be up to 40%. So what about full sickness there? It is one of the most common problems we see in shoulder clinics. And as 
all of you, we can categorize them into degenerative and traumatic tears. We can manage them with physio or repair. And usually we find that GP is referring patients based on uh, uh, the M uh, scans demonstrating a rupture of the tendon worried about it but who should we operate on usually the simplest solutions aren't usually the right ones and so we look into the evidence and we contribute it to the evidence to see what do we really need to know and what are the outcomes what are the financial burdens and what is the natural history of rotator cuff problems including hearing rates and clinical outcomes and uh, what are the options that we can utilize and quickly we know now that traumatic tears is we always have a low threshold to operate on most of them uh, however with degenerative tears there is evidence saying that it might be associated with we can manage them non-operatively with physiotherapy we know that it is uh, if you scan 100 persons walking in the streets you can 50 percent of them might have a uh, tear and uh, we know that the, uh, the majority of these will be asymptomatic patients with no problems at all. The problem here in the evidence uh, with large and massive tears there is increased risk of recurrence. So as an orthopedic surgeon sitting in my clinic, how can I manage these? We actually looked at uh, the evidence uh, highlights that actually non-operative treatment can be an option, but what about surgery? Surgery in uh, this seminal paper by Robinson, looking at 1,600 patients, they found that, and we know that now, that rotator cuff surgery is significantly successful. And actually, we know from this paper by Millet that the outcomes can be maintained for a long period of time after cuff repair. And we know from this paper by Antoni that the majority of professional athletes can return to the same sport and the same level after surgery. So who to manage non-operatively and who to manage with surgery. There is a myth saying that we don't repair tears in old age. Actually we do, and Christian Gerber usually would tell me during fellowships that age is just a number. And we totally agree and Rashid has, published uh, a paper saying that age is not a big deal. And actually we looked at uh, 120 cuff repairs we've done and we had as many as other authors. And we found that the main important bits is the tendon quality and tear size and physiologic age of the patient. So we've undertaken a review uh, looking uh, at age and we found, and actually, there is this is a classic paper which demonstrated that age actually doesn't have a significant impact, and uh, on outcomes after cuff repairs. We did this review, which was published last uh, two years ago, and we found that the three Bs are the most important bit, which is the patient, the pathology, and the participation. And looking at the published evidence, uh, in my hands now, I think the most important bits to decide whether to repair or not is the physiologic age of the patient as well as the fatty infiltration. So if the patient has fatty infiltration of more than 50%, I would opt to for non-operative treatment. Always be cautious with smokers, those on steroids, and definitely patients with arthritis. So we looked at different repair techniques as well. We know arthroscopic repair has become the gold standard now, although the evidence says that possibly non-operative uh, open uh, repairs also has a role. We looked at uh, the, in this RCT uh, at three years uh, about whether to go for single row or double row, and we found that three years, there is no difference between single and double row in small and medium tears, and there is significant superiority for double row repair in patients with uh, large and massive tears. And subsequently, we uh, uh, now, if I have someone with a small or medium tear, I'll just do single row because there is no difference. It's quicker and earlier recovery and quick recovery. Uh, while if someone has large or massive tear, I'll opt for double row repair. So we also looked at patients' expectations and we found that the majority of patients has two main problems here. One, the, the pain, and second is the range of motion. And after cuff repairs, 
the scores and the functional outcomes continue to improve up to two years after surgery. And the majority of patients will, 90% of patients will be satisfied at two years from surgery and their expectations are met. One important bit to understand is that you have to have realistic counseling with patients about the current, uh, about the rotator cuff re uh, repair and what they should expect. So we know also, so we, in our review, we found that symptoms are not consistent with tear size. So you can have someone with a small tear with significant limitation and pain, while others with significant, uh, with large tears with good function and no problems. So what about timing? So for traumatic tears, we know that surgery in the first six months is associated with significant outcomes. And uh, that's according to this paper published by Duncan. What about healing rates? So interestingly, uh, the, all the evidence published about massive and large tears uh, up till 10 years ago had, has reported significant amount of free tears. But does it matter? Actually, of course, as expected, heel tendons will have better functions and the patients will be happier. But actually those with, uh, who will have a re -tear or unhealed repair will have satisfactory function compared with their preoperative level. So I so having a retear is not an indication for another repair, but actually you will find that patients continue to have some improvement according to this uh, paper by Robinson. So what about cuff integrity? By uh, uh, Kim also looked into that as well as Moriarty, and both of them found that although some, some patients might have healed uh, tendons compared with those without with a retear, but the functional gain is almost similar. And this paper by Lee, they found that the most important aspect uh, for counseling patients is the size and the fatty infiltration of the tendons. So what about traumatic incidents, there is a high significant, and so with traumatic tears, we know that we have to operate on them in six months. And actually, if you operate on someone with a traumatic tear more than two years down the line, the outcomes are inferior. So what happens natural history-wise if we don't repair this? So what it would be losing the concavity compression action of the cuff and patients might ultimately develop rotator cuff arthropathy. And there are different ways of managing rotator cuff arthropathy, which is the last bit of rotator cuff disease and the last ultimate end in some patients who the pathology would continue to take its course of action. Physiotherapy, and now we understand the importance of anterior deltoid strengthening, a core strengthening and improving the kinetic chain. And physiotherapy would be the first line of treatment for all these patients. And if fails, then a reverse shoulder replacement, putting the shoulder, uh, putting the deltoid at a biomechanical superior uh, liver arm so that the deltoid can overcome the deficient cuff tendons underneath. So natural history, looking at patients who would have, who wouldn't have repair, Ranibu found that the development of uh, large of full sickness there is huge and actually 40 percent with those with partial tears will develop uh, full sickness tears and will develop uh, the cuff tear arthropathy in 40 percent of the time at 22 years down the line and we know from this paper by Maman that the main risks would be old age here or patients older than 60 those with full sickness tears and those with fatty infiltration, which was the evidence published by Christian Gerber as well. So do we have to repair tendons? Financially, Materital has looked at different aspects and interestingly, which I think is a very good uh, paper, they found that actually, if you do repair, you save the patient $13,000 on average. However, the savings can be as high as 77 
thousand dollars for those who are 30 to nine uh, to 40 years and about eleven thousand dollars or actually almost twelve thousand dollars for those who are between 70 to 79 years old and they estimated that this would save a huge amount of uh, uh, dollars per year if you opt for repair. So what is the future? Uh, just to summarize, uh, to uh, summarize the future of cough healing, we know there are different aspects and now we're looking into alternatives and how to improve healing. We looked at uh, in this book as well as in different studies about biologic repair. We know that inflammatory uh, process of healing is associated with growth factors and there are many growth factors identified. There is was an initial interest of doing platelet rich plasma and stem cells injection in patients with, with augmentation with repairs. The evidence is not really supportive of adding PRP and stem cells as yet, so especially bearing in mind the cost and so we're still not shifting into going for that. We, uh, we actually, we, pop, we looked at augmentation, uh, either biologic, like what I've uh, shown you before, or structural uh, augmentation, especially with patients with fatty infiltration, as well as large tears. Uh, we wrote that technique and we wrote our results. We have different concepts and different graphs that's used. A lot of studies has been published uh, and more and more are continued to be published. With xenografts, the uh, results wasn't very satisfactory initially and things appears to be improving over the years. Uh, this, uh, and actually there is more shifting into augmented repairs in certain selected patients. We looked at our experience and we published our one year results uh, which included uh, 36 patients, and we found that we can achieve a healing rate of up around 80% in those patients. Second future number three would be gene therapy and nanosurgery, which is only and predominantly being done in the lab, not used clinically yet, but it can be, uh, can help with those patients with rotator cuff disease. Finally, for uh, rotator cuff arthropathy, we are uh, shifting into using navigation and virtual reality. And there are a lot of, a lot of aspects, uh, a lot of uh, work now being uh, done on uh, the utilization of virtual reality, uh, machine intelligence, artificial intelligence. And uh, in uh, our uh, Smart Health Academic Unit, we're looking at uh, these uh, aspects and how to improve the outcomes of patients undertaking different replacements, mainly shoulder arthroplasty. So repairable tears to find to cover the whole topic. Uh, there are different options starting from balloons, tendon transfers, superior capsule reconstruction and augmented repairs. We stopped doing the balloons because the evidence actually didn't require, wasn't very supportive, bearing in mind the con as a cost and all aspects. It is a technically challenging problem, especially in young patients without arthritis. There is a strong rule for uh, physiotherapy in the form of anterior deltoid re-education. There is evidence published as well about, uh, especially in elderly patients, about suprascapular nerve ablation, arthroscopic deprivement, how we, as well as Walsh, uh, said that it can be successful in up to 70% of the time. However, that doesn't stop progression. Partial repairs of the rotator cuff is another option. And the evidence says it might be better than doing nothing. And the rate of repair failure is almost more than, is for more than 40%. Repair, uh, for augmentation, as I mentioned earlier, like the uh, hamburger technique, which you published, or different concepts, and I'm sure many of the audience and the eminent surgeons would have different techniques, is also another, uh, and here I'm talking about augmentation of a partial repair, which can improve the outcomes, and we're looking at our data now. Balloon is uh, out of favor now. Uh, 
spacer implantation didn't show significant outcomes. And now the main treatment options in younger patients would be either a tendon transfer, so lower trapezius, uh, like the Mayo technique by Bassem and Hassan, of, um, or uh, the latissimus dorsi transfer, which was popularized uh, by Christian Gerber, different cons, uh, which actually is becoming a very popular option in younger patients. A reverse shoulder replacement, if they have arthritis, is a treatment of choice and the gold standard. And finally, superior capsule reconstruction, in which we use a patch and uh, to reconstruct, uh, to replace uh, the tendon, and that would prevent progression of rotator cuff arthropathy. But when the selected patients, you will have strong and better outcomes. Superior capsule reconstruction was originally popularized by Mihata and the results in the select, rightly selected patients are promising and satisfactory. Uh, in Mihata's results was very promising, but he used fascia later because uh, patches weren't uh, allowed in Japan. However, that we, uh, we, it is a commonly performed procedure and in the in the right patient, they, we, we can achieve good outcomes as per the review we've done. Massive cuff tears, there are a lot of uh, options. There are a lot of uh, modalities we can use. It's still a bit confusing. The evidence is contradictory somehow, but thank you. I'm sorry for talking for a long time. Thank you so much, Professor Mohamed Imam from East London University for this very interesting talk. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we will be very happy to receive questions from our dear uh, panelists and uh, attendees. Any questions to Professor Imam? Professor Raffaelli, you have any questions? Uh, Dr. Imam, I, I just want to say that your presentation was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Because in a, in a short time, you can talk about everything about the rotator cuff disease. Uh, and I agree with you about the, the pathology or the, the physiopathology of the, the disease, because you really don't know yet. It's not only impeachment disease, it's not only a degenerative disease, but it's a conjunct of all these times. And I really think that we need to, uh, to be uh, uh, some very good surgery or, or doctor to individualize each treatment. I don't think we just have to, to have a menu of treatment, but I really think just like you that we, we need to know uh, how, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of ways to repair the rotator cuff. We need to know the anatomy of the rotator cuff to do the best for the patient. Uh, I just want to say uh, congratulations. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, uh, presentation. I take some pictures of that and I really love it. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rafael. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Rafael. Thank, thank you so much, Professor Iman. Thank uh, you. Now to the second speaker. The next speaker will be Professor Mohi Taha from uh, Zurich University, uh, Switzerland. Professor uh, Taha will speak about uh, virtual reality and shoulder replacement. Professor Taha is now in Egypt in the North Coast. I hope the connection are uh, doing well, sir. We hope, I hope you can hear me. I can You're hear you. in Egypt, my dear brother. <laughs> Thank you. We have Professor Adel Adawi with us, uh, the Professor Taha. Professor Adel Adawi, the uh, president, of course, of the uh, Egyptian Medical Association and the former president of Health and Population in Egypt. And sure, the, it's the North Coast pretty North well North known. How the North Coast? You like it? We love it. Kids love Thank it. You. They burn You're themselves. Welcome. I burn myself. Everybody is happy. I hope the videos will be working, sir. You can. He's muted. Yes, you are muted, sir. Ah, uh, can you share yes. the videos from your uh, screen? I sent all of them. Uh, Doctor Muhammad. Yeah, Doctor Muhammad, we share. Share the videos.
Yeah. Muhammad, the videos are not working or, or what? Professor Taha, the videos are working, I think. That's great. Uh, the audio, can he start it? It's already audio recorded. Okay, sir. In the following video, I will show what we can currently do with mixed reality and the case combining mixed reality and navigation. So here I have my scapula. So I can move it around. Put it there, check it. It's the fruition here. Not a very good one. Here, not the fruition. So let me move it again. Like this one. Here. Now it's looking better. Let's move it around again. Now. Okay. Let's move it around again. Now. Okay. 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 Then I'll put some for my hand. With thumb roller, although you see here, you have some perforation. If I look at mine, I have no perforation. Hello, everybody. Today, I'm going to show you how to use the tool to show your patient actually what you see in your footprints. Uh, I start with my computer, with my teams, to my footprints. So now I just start, start the diagram. Here, ready to go. So we can show the patient how he really has. 
So guys, actually, it's fun to welcome you in my living room in Switzerland. So we have Phyllis from Scotland, we have John from the United States, and we have Thomas Gregory from France. I see you waving, John. That's great. John, hello. And we have a ball in the middle of the moon. So, Thank you, uh, You're welcome. Thank you for coming to me. For Sasaida. Masalama. Professor Mohi, are with us, sir? Yes, I am. Yes, I, I think the, the uh, connection is not uh, very well for the videos. But if you please can uh, enumerate to us what's meant by virtual reality and how it is uh, being used in the shoulder surgery and the shoulder replacement. Uh, 
We have seen sure. you. We want to hear you, sir. Sure. So the whole idea, there is a difference between virtual reality and mixed reality. The first version which we see is uh, virtual reality, which you are totally virtual. You have um, virtual reality um, glasses and you wear them and you are in a different world that, than the current world. You know this, like also it's available for games. You can do games in there. You can uh, see uh, another world. You can diving, you can go uh, like watching a movie inside a different world. And this is uh, available also for training for orthopedic surgeons. There are some uh, softwares where you can train operating skills, where you can train um, simulation of an operation inside that virtual reality um, classes. So this is one part of the virtual reality. The other or the more advanced or what we use now, we, we can apply to the surgery is the so um, called mixed reality. In a mixed reality, you can see both. So you can part is the virtual, these holograms where you can do the 3D uh, reconstruction of the scapula of the patient, of the humerus, of the planning of your uh, processes. And what you can do is transform this or send it to your HoloLens or some other uh, virtual mixed reality visualization glasses. And through this, you can take actually your planning, your x-rays, your MRIs, your CT with you every day. You are uh, everywhere. You are independent of any infrastructure of the hospital. You have your preoperative planning with you. You are sterile and still you can move your x-ray, your MRI, you can move your preoperative planning um, you can show it to the others in the operating theater. So if you have any screen, computer screen, just simple connected with uh, Microsoft Teams, and they can also view what you view. And this is the idea of mixed reality. And the HoloLens itself as um, apparatus, you can compare it to an iPhone or a smartphone. So what we have is um, difference between an analog uh, mobile phone, like the old uh, well-known Nokia uh, 6210, and when the iPhone arrived. So what we used to do today is the 3D prints. So we have a plastic part, hard part, where you have to sterilize, take to the operating theater, then you cannot fix it to the position. So you have to hold it with one hand and then you have to operate with the other hand. So it's hard. And um, the more advanced or the smart solution now is the mixed reality. One part of the mixed reality or the glasses is that you can view the preoperative planning. But the other things are the other options which I tried to show in the videos. So there are different possibilities. You have different apps. It's like a mobile phone, you download the apps and through the apps, you have more stuff to do. So Microsoft Mesh, that's which allows you to meet several persons through their avatars. You stay in a room, you can work together, you can talk together, you can manipulate the planning, you can work on one virtual hologram all together simultaneously at the same time. So we can do some meeting like what we are doing now to discuss difficult cases. You can discuss it with your residents. I can be here. My residence is in Switzerland. It has a difficult case. We can meet, we can discuss it together, no matter where, if you have a good internet connection. That's you need. <laughs> I know that you are one of the most experienced surgeons in Switzerland and all over the world in mixed reality shoulder uh, surgery and shoulder replacement. But I, I'm asking about the applicability of such a technique in uh, yani all over the world. In Egypt, is this applicable for uh, everyone? This, this is the advance. The main difference, what I do or what I used to do before mixed, moving to mixed reality is navigation. And navigation... Yeah. I, as you said, it is limited, it is expensive. If you get robotic, it costs $2 million, yeah. all of that. And this is a good advantage actually of mixed reality or why I'm very a big fan of mixed reality because you can actually wear it everywhere. You can use it in any country. You are independent of the infrastructure of the hospital. So you can go anywhere 
and you have your planning and use it. So um, all, all what you need is uh, mixing like the HoloLens or something equivalent, and then the software to export your um, planning to a hologram. So one of the cases it was um, on the video, this is like a real time, which I did uh, three weeks ago. This is an 81 year uh, female patient, which has uh, massive osteoarthritis. She has been suffering already for six years. She didn't want to get operated on in the beginning and we tried uh, non-operative treatment and then it becomes more advanced, became more wear and tear of the glenoid. So it's very medialized. I don't know if you can start the video so you can see actually the CT builder. I decided to plan a bio RSA 3D planning hologram for the bio RSA. And this is how it should look like. Here you see osteophytes at the front and at the back, which we'll have to remove interoperatively. And take every part out of each other, as you can see the this plant, uh, this plate, this is the extended one. You can see scapula and the graft. So this is the GPS application that actually we're looking at. So it's been here before. So much you can change in this same information. That's how we plan that's exported. The application is fixed on the contralateral side of the patient using mixed uh, reality in addition to the navigation is the uh, facultative uh, microcoid process is important and our reference uh, to navigation. It's a regular related to vectoral approach uh, and then external release and substituted uh, release, uh, removing the bursa and any additions uh, between the deployed and the rest of the rotator cuff. This is an important uh, step for the exposure of the humeral head. MIU scissors can be used uh, and uh, spread uh, in, under the delta. And then part of the CA ligament uh, can be released. The long uh, biceps tendon can be identified to the bicepital groove. This is a good uh, reference uh, separating the greater tubercle from the tubercle minor. The biceps synthesis or tenotomy uh, could be done in this case uh, with uh, a lot of uh, tendinopathy of the long and the biceps tendon I decided to do for uh, tenotomy. As you can see, the biceps and the sheath is also very thickened. I find uh, three sisters at the lower border of the subscapularis, and uh, I like it. I
like the from uh, 10 of me to the subscribers uh, and then a small uh, bridge is uh, left uh, for uh, reattachment uh, later the capsule release is performed uh, at the interior part of the humeral also around the presence of osteophytes. The subscopular tendon is tagged uh, using uh, two o suture in the Maiden Island technique. These sutures will be used uh, for the reattachment uh, of the tendon later. Now the human head can be a good visualized and exposed. The graft is uh, prepared and uh, harvested uh, in situ according to the pre operative uh, planning and uh, hologram. A five millimeter uh, graft is uh, obtained after. If the food retractor doesn't work well, you can use instead the bunny retractor, also known as a Playboy retractor. A woman retractor, the superior and the pancart retractor anterior are usually helpful for the exposure. I use a ranger for the septus of tissue remover here because of the navigation and be aware not to remove crucified until the navigation part is done. After that, I perform the interior release of the tricep staying close to the bone to avoid any nerve injury. For the navigation, it is uh, important uh, to have a good exposure of the coracoid uh, process and uh, having a home and medially is uh, helpful uh, in uh, this uh, situation. So here, um, as you see, for the navigation part, uh, we're still with the mixed reality, we are limited. We cannot navigate with the mixed reality. What you can do, you can pre-operatively plan. You can take your hologram with you. You can place your hologram beside the glenoid and you can see and compare. Similar when you have a 3D printed glenoid with difficult cases. But we are working, I'm working with um, different companies developing solutions for the navigation using mixed reality. And I think we have been able to do it on cadavers. So the next step would be um, doing the um, studies for the release and the CA um, acceptance and getting accredited in Europe. So this will take us, I think, by the end of next year, we will be able to navigate through the mixed reality. At the moment, we have for the navigation part, we need to use a still. Uh... Sir, you are muted, sir. Dr. Mohi, you are muted. 
Oh, sorry. So yeah. <laughs> the, the good thing about the mixed reality, you can take it anywhere and I can use it here. I can operate with it in Egypt. I can operate with it in Australia. I can operate with it anywhere. Um, problem you cannot, still you cannot navigate with the mixed reality. So this is the current limitation of uh, the HoloLens or any other uh, product. So uh, we are working closely with uh, two companies to develop solutions for this. We have been able to uh, do it in cadavers. So the next step will be applying for the CA accrediting in Europe and um, having by the end of next year, a solution which can allow us to navigate using our HoloLens for um, mixed reality, which will can allow us to skip the part of the navigation at all. And we don't need this GPS navigation anymore, hopefully soon. So um, in summary, you can combine both at the moment if you need to navigate your Glenoid, but you can still use it as a 3D printer. So you have a 3D print, 3D print just as a hologram. You can use it, you can play around, you can fix it. You can um, duplicate what you have planned without navigation. So this is the stand we have and today. Um, the next video will show how does the navigation actually work. This is not like the old fashioned navigation. We have like three cameras everywhere around the operating theater. It's just this tablet and the camera is embedded on it. And you have the glenoid tracker, you have the, on the one on the coracoid and one on your drill. So you can always real time drill in the correct retroversion inclination. And accordingly, you are sure where your pick is gonna go inside um, and you are very accurate. And this is what we are still missing in the mixed reality part. But otherwise you can do conferences, you can connect, you can discuss cases, you can plan together. You have a lot of options through the mixed reality HoloLens class. Sir, do you, do you uh, perform the mixed reality technique in every case or you preserve it just for uh, complicated and revision cases? Navigate, I use them separately, so they are independent of each other. Mixed reality, I use with every case. Navigation, I only use in complicated, where I use allograft, uh, bio RSA, uh, big retroversion of more than 15 degrees. Um, these are the cases which I like to use uh, navigation. But mixed reality is actually all what you need for mixed reality is just a CT. So I do a CT anyway, regularly before um, doing any procedures. So you have the CT, DICOM pictures, and then you export them. That's all what you need. So I do it for every case, the mixed reality part. I hope, Dr. Taha, in your uh, next vacation, after you spend uh, part of it in the North Coast, <laughs> I hope you will uh, have, a, we, we will have a chance to, uh, uh, to visit us and uh, do some cases in um, my university. Uh, so the junior surgeons will be uh, accustomed to this uh, marvelous technique, sir. Sure, I'd be more than happy because actually yeah. you don't need a lot of infrastructure. I'll just get it with me and you... It's ready to go. So thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. The, the yeah. videos are uh, are working, or uh, Muhammad, the video is working. If we have time, we can show you yes. the last yes, video. Yes, it yes, shows sir. the navigation. Yes, of course, sir. Of course, sir. Sure. The connection, the North Coast is not. Uh, is not good. No, it's, it's very hard. Yeah. That's why I sent all of the videos before anything. Sure. <laughs> but I can comment it if it's not. Uh, yes, please. If the audio is not working. Yeah, yes, please. Like. Please. Sure. So what we see is um, the tracker. So this is the extra steps for um, the navigation. Before that, we show the very normal steps for the processes. And now you have... Um, a tracker and this tracker has to be fixed to the coracoid process so you have one small anterior screw which you fix first but don't tie too much then comes a long posterior screw you can scroll it down and this is for the fixation and then you go again and uh, re-tighten the anterior screw sometimes you need to tap 
on it. Don't tell the company you're not allowed to officially, but I just tap it and it works better. You get more, uh, it gets tighter, easier. And then after that, um, you put the glenoid tracker. Once you place it on it, there is a click, you feel it, and then you rotate to the correct position. After that, it stays stable. So you have to find the correct position and then what's stable, then you have your position. Then you can see on the right hand side is the screen, which I look at. On the left side is the operative place. So what you do is you start the acquisition. So you have to identify the computer is gonna tell you on the tablet, it tells you every single step. So the first step is to identify base of uh, coracoid then the anterior border of the coracoid, then the lower surface of the coracoid. And the navigation system did already import your planning and your CT. So, and that's how it can compare real time. Okay, where is the position you are having now according to the CT? And then you go across the anterior border of the glenoid. Then you identify the 12, three, six and nine o'clock. After finishing that, you go through all of the uh, glenoid surface. And many people ask about the HoloLens, if you can wear it, if you can wear it for two or two and a half hours during the operation, uh, you get used to it. Like when you start wearing eyeglasses at the beginning, you, you feel it, you notice it. After that, after five minutes, you just get used to it and you don't even notice that you are wearing uh, the HoloLens. And after that, uh, finishing the tracking, it gives you a green marking, which means, okay, uh, steps are correct. You have been tracked. This was a challenging case because of the huge esophytes anteriorly and posteriorly. So it was a challenge also for uh, the navigation to find the correct entry point. And these are also uh, the cases which I'm uh, very uh, thankful when I have my HoloLens and I have my hologram in front of me so I can real time compare what the GPS is saying was my pre-operative planning. Technique is great, but uh, still um, you need to double check everything because um, it can also make errors with such big osteophytes. That's why also I uh, said in the video, like it's important to remove only the soft tissue at the beginning and don't uh, remove the osteophytes because your CT has osteophytes in it. Same as uh, PSI and patient specific instrumentation when you have these plastic guides, you also, um, they are all done on the CT. So you need to keep the osteophytes. Uh, this is an important step. It takes two to three minutes to do the calibration. Um, but after that, you can see real time on the left side, that's my uh, drill. And on the right side, there is a green dot. That's my entry point. And then for the inclination, um, antiversion, you can see a circle, orange circle. And when the orange circle is aligned on that green dot, you are in the correct position. And then you can drill. From here on, it is as simple as uh, any other uh, steps for uh, reverse rotor processes. You drill your ream and then um, we had a graft as well and that's also one of the good advantages of the mixed reality because you can always view the pre-operatively planned um, graft how big it should be Dr. Taha, you are muted again. You are muted again. Oh, thank you. You are hearing me now. So uh, with the um, mixed reality, you can see the hologram, you can double check, and you can see the graft. You can cut it uh, as you preoperative plan it. I use the ranger to clear all of the osteophytes and the soft tissue. I find it's a good extension of my hand and finger and I don't have to go deep in the tissues. That's uh, the long pig with the graft on it. You go through it and you know, okay, um, that's the correct position which I planned. You tap, it's like, uh, yeah, you have to be careful while tapping with these long pigs. 
you tap, wait a little bit, tap again, wait a little bit, as if, as we learned it all from the hip processes, uh, when you do it without cement, all of this, you have to just wait for the uh, bone to relax and readjust. I haven't seen, and that's um, after inserting the humeral components, and you can see intraoperative X-ray and postoperative X-ray of the patients. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mohita from uh, Zurich University, Switzerland, for this interesting, very interesting technique. It's my pleasure. Thanks for Thank inviting you. me. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, any questions to Professor Taha? Okay, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And thank you for joining us in your vacation. <laughs> no problem, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Our next speaker will be Professor Maggit Sami from Anchamps University. Professor Maggit? Okay. Well, after listening to this uh, very nice and high-tech presentation, uh, I think we will come back to the ground and face some of the cases that we actually see here in Egypt and see how we can deal with them. And my topic is about locked shoulder dislocation. This case is a 30 years old guy who is addicted to tramadol tablets. And he came with a neglected locked anterior shoulder dislocation for one month. Actually, we have seen a few of these cases and these guys addicted to tramadol, they get seizures. And surprisingly, sometimes they get anterior dislocations rather than posterior dislocations. And the strange part is we can understand that sometimes posterior dislocations can be missed, but these guys have missed anterior dislocations, which mean that they do not even seek medical advice, because as we can see on the x-ray, you cannot miss that this is a dislocated shoulder, unlike a posterior dislocation, which can be sometimes deceiving. This is what we have. When we have an engaging hill sac which is left locked in the anterior dislocation, the strong hard bone of the anterior border edge of the glenoid keeps on impacting inside the humeral head. And therefore, we usually see huge hill sacs defects. And any trial to do a forceful manipulation and more deepening of the hill sacs defect up to splitting of the humeral head. So when you have a case like this, missed locked dislocation do not attempt to do a closed reduction of course these guys since sometimes they don't really suffer from the pain due to their addiction it seems that they try to rotate the shoulders and therefore they get more deepening of the defect so thinking about this the real problem that we have is a huge hill sex defect we know the concept of glenoid track. It's the width of the hill sex defect plus the attachment of the rotator cuff on one side and 83% of the diameter of the glenoid in the maximum diameter part. If the width of the hill sex defect is more than the glenoid track, then we will have an off track or engaging lesion and they will keep on dislocating again. So what to do, how to make this glenoid track better, how to make an off-track lesion an on-track lesion. The logic approach having a, a large hill sax defect is to graft this defect, to decrease the size of the hill sax defect. Since the pathology in these cases comes from the humeral part rather than from the glenoid, which is usually not affected. 
So it might seem logic to do grafting of the Hill-Sachs defect, whether with iliac graft, or we tried for some time to do oats grafts from the knee to have some cartilage and increase the range, or to do a, a remplissage for this huge defect. This all seems logic, but what we will present here is a little bit of different approach to these cases. The idea is we have to do an open approach for these locked cases. You cannot do a closed reduction. You will end up by deepening the defect and splitting the head. So you start by the classic deltopectoral approach. And then the head is shifted medially, as we expect in, in an anterior dislocation. So once we open, the head is, is, is somewhere here medially. To expand our approach, we have to release the, the conjoined tendon. So either you release the conjoined tendon and then you reattach again after the end of the procedure, or you do, and then of course you can face the possibility that it will not heal and it will be pulled down. So it's better to do a bony osteotomy of the coracoid with the conjoined tendon and then fix back to the coracoid. What we thought is, because anyway, we are going to do a coracoid osteotomy to, to enlarge our approach. Why not do a later J for these cases? It's not a classic later J because we will not apply through a subscapular split. It's more like a, a bony augmentation of the glenoid, but that's what we want. We will attack this off-track lesion, not by decreasing the, the, the size of the lesion, but by increasing the size of the glenoid track. So even though the, the defect will remain the same, but the glenoid track will be much longer. So this off-track lesion will now become on track. Once we have done the osteotomy of the coracoid and we do it as large as we can, we do it exactly just anterior to the attachment of the CC ligaments. So it's at the junction between the horizontal and the vertical part of the coracoid to take the largest possible part of the coracoid. We then release the subscapularis, take it with tension suture, take it with, with sutures so that we will attach by the end of the procedure. And then we unlock our lock dislocation. Of course, if you try to do any form of internal rotation, you will deepen the defect. So first of all, you have to start by pulling the humeral head in an and through lateral direction to unlock this locked dislocation. It has to be unlocked first before trying to do any rotation. And do not try to insinuate any Hohmann retractors or any periosteal elevators between the glenoid and the head, thinking that you can lever the head out, because again, you will end up by deepening the defect or even splitting the head. Once we have unlocked the dislocation, we can rotate the head and we can see the huge size of the hill sex defect. It might seem logic to graft it, but we chose to, to go for another approach as we mentioned, since anyway, we have done the coracoid osteotomy. One of the things that we have noticed is that once we try to locate them back, they keep on jumping anteriorly. And this is because unlike we might expect, the posterior capsule is tight. We think that once we have an, a locked anterior dislocation, theoretically, the posterior capsule is stretched. That's not the case. It's tight. So once you have unlocked the dislocation with the electrocautery, we go and we release the posterior capsule so we have enough space that the humeral head would rest posteriorly and will not be pushed anteriorly because of the long duration, the soft tissues got adapted to this locked anterior dislocation. Once we reposition it back in place, we increase the glenoid arc by the coracoid process. Of course, this is not a classic lethargy because as we said, we effect. We are only elongating the glenoid arc. So this is what we do. We fixed the large coracoid piece to the glenoid, increasing the size of the glenoid arc. The hill sacs defect is there, but as we rotate, it's no longer engaging. It's on track 
because we have elongated the glenoid tract. Since it's an open procedure, you can add an open rim plassage. With rotation, we can easily see the defect. You can put your anchors here, and then as you put it back, you, you pull the sutures through the infraspinatus and you suture it. So you can add an open rim plassage if you choose, but we did not think that this is necessary, and we wanted to see the results with this technique. This is how it looks. So this is an off-track engaged hill sax, and this is how it looks by the end of the procedure. The hill sax is there, but even with maximum external rotation, it will not engage on the glenoid. It will remain on track because we have elongated the glenoid track. We published this technique, having done it on six patients, and we have not had redislocations in any of these six patients. Of course, this is a, a small number of patients, but locked, neglected anterior dislocation is not a common entity. So this is one way of facing humeral head defects by neglecting the defect and working on the glenoid tract by elongating the glenoid tract. The other approach is to work on the hill sacs defect or on the humeral head defect in general, either by bone graft or by doing a muscle transfer or muscle tenodesis. And this is what we do for locked posterior dislocation. This is a case with a locked posterior shoulder dislocation, which was neglected for three weeks. You can see the overlap here, and you can see the dislocation, the locked dislocation, and the reverse hill sex defect on the MRI. We have to suspect the posterior shoulder dislocations. If you see this really internally rotated humeral head, which is di different in shape from the normal AP, I will show this. You have to suspect shoulder dislocation with certain traumas, with seizures, convulsions, and with electric shocks. And it should not be painful, even in an acute trauma setting to do a passive external rotation of the adducted shoulder. So if you do a passive external rotation of the adducted shoulder, of course, this is under anesthesia, but you do it as you examine the patient, and it's completely locked, there is no external rotation, then you have to suspect that this is a locked posterior dislocation and in this diagnosis. So please, if you suspect it on the X-ray, you have to examine the patient by passive external rotation in abduction. If it's locked, there's, he cannot go beyond the neutral position, then you have to go for external image. This is what we call the light bulb sign. This is how it looks when it's completely internal rotated in the locked posterior dislocation. And this is quite different from the normal AP. This is not an AP of the shoulder in the anatomic scapular planes because we cannot see the joint line, but even though, and the light bulb with the internal rotation. If you have this suspicious X-ray with the locked shoulder, not going to external rotation passively in abduction, which as I said, is not a painful position even in the acute trauma setting, then you have to suspect a, a locked posterior shoulder dislocation because 40 to 60% of these cases are missed because they come in a sling. So you, you expect with the sling that it's normal to look in internally rotated because he's in a sling. The sling puts the, the shoulder automatically in internal rotation. You try to move it, you think it's painful, so I will not try to push it into rotation and they get missed. So in the imaging, additional, X-rays should be done, the wide scapular view, the axillary view. The axillary view, of course, is not applicable in the acute trauma setting. It's too painful. You cannot put the arm in this type of abduction. So you, we can go for the pumped up or what we call the trauma axillary view or the velpo view where he leans backwards and you can have the X-ray. Once you suspect, it's very important to do a CT because the CT will confirm the diagnosis and you can measure your reverse hill sacs. 
because you can go for grafting if this is 20 to 45 percent of the humeral head if more than this this is a completely destroyed humeral head and you might think of replacement so this case presented to me and surprisingly he presented with the mri because he had shoulder pain it was not diagnosed and they asked for an MRI to see what is the, the reason of the shoulder pain. And the MRI said it's a lot posterior dislocation. So waiting for the MRI to diagnose a posterior shoulder dislocation, because we have no idea why he's still in pain after two or three weeks, means that no one cared to examine the passive external rotation in abduction. Of course, you can see the locked posterior dislocation with the reverse heel sacs, and you can see the humeral head in these posterior cuts where the glenoid is not seen because it's posterior to the glenoid. We do a standard deltopectoral approach, but in these cases, we prefer to do the modified McLaughlin. We go for attacking the uh, for the attacking the reverse hill sacs because you cannot really do a large bone graft on the posterior aspect. It will be too annoying for the patient. It will raise the infraspinatus. You cannot put large bone grafts on the posterior glenoid aspect. And second, we want to do the relocation from an anterior approach, and we don't want to do a mixed anterior and posterior approach. So you can do the whole work from the anterior approach and in these cases, we will work on the defect, the, 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 the humeral head defect, to fill this defect. And therefore, again, this off-track lesion will become on-track. What we do is we do a, a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. And since we have a large defect, we prefer to do the osteotomy just medial to the bicepital groove. So we, we locate the bicepital groove and we start our osteotomy just medial to the bicepital groove to get as large piece of bone as we can get. So we do the osteotomy and we get a really large piece of bone, the lesser tuberosity with the attached subscapularis. Of course, we know that the original McLaughlin procedure described some 70 years ago in 1952, he only did a soft tissue tenodesis of the remplissage, but in a reverse hill sex lesion and done 70 years ago. But this had a high redislocation re rate, so feeling with the bone graft from the lesser tuberosity together with the, with the subscapularis yielded more satisfactory results. Again, you have to unlock the dislocation and do not try to force the humerus into external rotation. You will end up by deepening the defect and splitting the humeral head. So you have to push the, the humeral head posteriorly and laterally first to unlock it before doing the external rotation. Once you do this, you can see the size of the hill sacs defect, and you can put the lesser tuberosity with the subscapularis and fixed by screws, and then you test in maximum internal rotation. There is no locking, it's not catching on the edge of the glenoid. If this is the case, then you, you do not need to use any special slings or shoulder holders that would keep the hand in neutral or external rotation. He can use a normal sling even in maximum internal rotation because it does not lock in internal rotation. And this is how it looks on the X-ray. Sometimes the defect is too large or your osteotomy is not that big that you need even with the lesser tuberosity to add bone graft from the lesser tuberosity. And with the screws, you add sutures. Either you can put anchors and fix by, by, by the sutures of the anchor, or you can do transosseous suturing. And this is how it looks. If you fear that this, there is a small piece of the defect left that may engage on the posterior rim of the glenoid, then you have to support the shoulder in neutral rotation for six weeks and not allowed to fall into internal rotation. And this is how it looks on the post-operative X-ray and CT. And this is the one-year post-operative range of motion for a patient with neglected 
locked posterior shoulder dislocation. So the take home message is that engaging or off track head defects, whether hill sacs in anterior dislocations or reverse hill sacs in posterior dislocations can be rendered on track, non engaging, either by grafting the defect with bone graft or by rendering the defect extra articular through filling it by muscle, whether infraspinatus stenodesis for hill sacs or subscapularis stenodesis for reverse hill sacs. Or you can neglect the head defect and work on the glenoid, elongating its arc so that this off track lesion will be changed to an on track lesion, which we apt to use for the neglected anterior dislocations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Maggie Sami and Shams University for this very interesting talk. If we have any questions to Professor Maggie. Professor Maggie, good evening. Yes. Good evening. Uh, do you think that we can do some treatment of this uh, locked posterior dislocation only for uh, only using arthroscopy view to do like a McLaughlin stuff using a, a arthroscopy, or you prefer to do it open always? Difficult to do a closed relocation of the joint. And once I'm going to go for an open reduction, I will have to do what I just described. If it's just presenting and you can do a simple closed relocation of the joint, of course, you can do an arthroscopic subscapularis stenodesis. OK, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Maggot. And uh, now we will uh, move to the uh, next speaker. The next speaker is my dear friend, Professor Mauricio Raffaelli from Nayon Institute, Brazil. You're very welcome, Professor Raffaelli. Hello, everyone. Uh, just a minute. I just want to. I have some troubles here to show my screen. Just a second. Take your time, sir. I normally don't use this computer. This is my office computer. Normally I use my home computer. Let's see if I can share my screen now. Just a second. Now, I think I can do that. Yes. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, perfect. Uh, I just want to say, Dr. Mohamed, uh, uh, it's an honor to me to be part of this uh, incredible meeting. It's fantastic to, to see Dr. Iman presentation, Dr. Magnet's presentation, and Dr. Mohitaha is, a, is, a, is the name here in the shoulder uh, disease to do the, the planning and the 3D reconstruction and using this type of uh, future stuffs to teach us. Here in Brazil, we have Dr. Bruno Gobato. He works with Dr. Taha. And it's, it's good to see that. The reality, the 3D reality, will be the reality for us in a, in a short time. I will talk uh, uh, about the massive rotator cuff tear. Dr. Iman just told a lot of the rotator cuff, so I go directly to the massive rotator cuff stuffs. This is my group that I made part from Brazil. Our leader is Dr. José Carlos Garcia Jr. from Sao Paulo, Brazil, the Nyon Institute. No disclaimer. And for me, the, the, the first part is to understand and to def define what is the massive rotator cuff tear. Because when you look for the literature, someone will say about two tendons with a, a lesion more than four centimeters Another stuff said uh, one tendon with more than four centimeters. Another stuff said, another paper said for us, uh, you need to, be, to, to have the great tuberosity exposed. So I found this paper that tried to determine the, the, the definition of the ro massive rotator cuff tear. So in this study, uh, the tendon retraction should be in the glenoid hem and the tear 
uh, should expose the great tuberosity more than 67%. So we have the supraspinatus and great and big part of the infraspinatus, big lesion to define a massive rotator cuff tear. Another way that you do that is to use the arthroscopy to, to try to understand and to, to measure this tear. And this paper from Dr. Lederman showed for us there is one big difficult to create some algorithm to treat all the massive rotator cuff tear because there is some patient factors, there is another associate pathologies and the personal experience and the data that the, the, our doctor that we have uh, interfer in our experience to treat this lesion. So what you need to do for a very good cuff repair planning. So we have some steps. The first is identification of the lesion. The second part is to uh, understand the mobility from the tendon. The bone preparation of the footprint and the quality of this bone is very important. And you should do a steed, a tension free, and try to do an atomic tendon fixation. If you do these four steps, you are very close to have a healing tendon. So to do that, I think uh, 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 us, our, uh, us, the shoulder surgeons, need to, do, to need to know a lot of things. The first part is to know the cuff anatomy. We need to know the function. We need to know the innervation. You need to know the tension, the vascularity, and the footprint of the tendon. Because if you try to do it anatomically, you need to recover the position of the rotator cuff. Another stuff that we need to know uh, is different ways to repair the cuff. Because I really think uh, the, re the repair from the rotator cuff don't, don't exist a menu to do that. We need to individualize each repair. And to individualize each repair, we need to know different ways to use that. Uh, anchors, uh, 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 not anchors, and uh, not less anchors, single row repair, double row repair, we need to understand and to try to do the best for the patient. And you must to know the different way to repair uh, and the different evolution for each uh, repair that you know. In this, in this paper, in this study, showing for us that the transosseous equivalent is a little bit better in contact tendon uh, when you compare to other ways to do the repair. So if you can recover anatomically the tendon, I think the transosseous equivalent way using anchors is a good uh, a fixation to treat these lesions. Another thing is you need to individualize the cuff repair. So each patient has a, a type of lesion and a, a, a bad tissue that you need to, to try to understand to fix that. In this study, uh, Dr. Iman just told for us the, the double row repair uh, and the single row repair has had, had good uh, evolution when you compare the repair of this, this way to fix. But in lesions more than three centimeters or 30 millimeters, the double row technique is recommended to repair because it has a lower repair rate. You need to know your patient injury. Uh, you need to understand, is this cuff repairable or not? So Dr. Gartzman in this paper, 1996, uh, creates some parameters using the tear size measure, the tendon quality, the tendon mobility, and the suture rate replacement to evaluate if you can repair or not this uh, massive rotator cuff tear. But since a lot of things uh, evolved, so I changed that. So uh, us understand a little bit more the pathology of the rotator cuff. And Dr. Pascal Bolo and Dr. Gilles Walsh made this study in 2008 to understand the criteria to repair this tendon. So if you have a, a substantial retracture tendon with bad, with bad quality from the tendon and from the bone, it's difficult to repair the stairs. Advanced rotator cuff muscular atrophy, Gutalier stage three or stage four, when the cuff, when the muscle uh, has more uh, fat tissue than muscle tissue, is very, very difficult to fix the massive tears. And the pressmore migration with uh, an acromial interval 
uh, less than seven millimeters uh, uh, showed for us a, a difficult place to put the anchors and to recover this interval. And you must know your patient. You need to understand what's the patient expectation. What do you want with this surgery? We need to have less pain. We need to recover the range of motion and the strength, the strength of your arm, or you just need to have a good life. We need to understand the associated disease, diabetes, it has some bad healing results in the rotator cuff repair. And another thing is very important if you have a smoke patient. The smoke patient have some uh, uh, vascular uh, alterations that can uh, affect the healing. So improve the failure of this arthro arthroscopy. And for me, the doctor needs to do two things uh, with your patient. The first is explain the injury. Your patient must know the good and the bad results and some solutions for the goods and for the bad results that you can do. And you need to always do your best because the massive rotator cuff there is very, very difficult to, to improve the quality of your repair, your repair. So I bring here two clinical cases of my practice to try to understand when you can recover the anatomically distended and another that we can't recover the anatomic, uh, anatomic seat of the rotator cuff. This is a patient, Mayo, 54 years old, lawyer, just practice walking, right shoulder pain for four years with a progressive worsening for one month after fall. So his patient just had some pain in the shoulder, but he fell down and he improved the, 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 the pain and improve the, uh, the uh, loss of range of motion. This orthopedic physical examination, the near test was positive, the Hawking Kennedy test was positive. The job test is positive with loss of resistance in elevation when you compare with the lateral size. Palmer test negative, Gerber test negative, beer hug test negative. The infraspinatus test was positive and the drop arm is negative. So the patient had some pathology in the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus, but not a huge uh, posterior lesion of the rotator curve. Uh, uh, with this, this examination, I think that the uh, teres minor and part of the infraspinatus maintain uh, attached to the bone. Uh, the patient has normal range of motion, but inactive movement presents 75 degrees of elevation. And this is the exams of this patient. So you can see a, a big uh, supraspinatus there, some fat infiltration from the supraspinatus. Uh, the part of infraspinatus is very bad to see in the skirt, and the x-ray was normal. And this is what I did. This is looking for the uh, subacromial space. Uh, my portal is post, port, uh, posterior lateral. Now I'm clean the bursa. The gland, you can see the glenoid. The, the, this lesion is very, very big. I try to clean all the bursa to understand. Looking that the infraspinatus, the lower part of the infraspinatus maintain attached to the bone. So we have the upper part of, so we, we have the upper part of the inf infraspinatus and the supraspinatus lesion. Now we're using a grasper, try to understand the form of this lesion and the mobility of this tendon. So I can reduce the lesion in the anatomic way. And I will uh, try to do a best uh, repair for this patient. I want to try a double row repair. In the first time I will pass a, a tendon to tendon suture, uh, fix this upper part of the infraspinatus together with the lower part of the infraspinatus. And this uh, repair, this suture, just fix a very good part of the posterior lesion and reduce the size of the supraspinatus tear too. When I type this knot, the lesion from supraspinatus become a little bit smaller. And using a grasper, I try to understand if I can reduce this anatomically. And look at that, I, yes, I can do that anatomically. So I go for a double row fixation. I really like to prepare the bone to attach this tendon. I really think that the blood that comes to, the, to this, uh, to this re, uh, 
to displace is important to heal the tendon. Using uh, medial anchors quite near to the cartilage site, this is the first anchor, this is an anteromedial anchor. I like to pass the suture, one suture, a simple suture, and other suture in a, in a mattress way. And then I put another posterior anchor, and then I will put a knotless anchor in the lateral part of the great tuberosity to complete the transos equivalent way to fix that. This is a knotless anchor for footprint for Smith and Nephew. And it's good to, uh, uh, to fix, to attach, and the tension, uh, we can tension this standard a lot to maintain the position. So if you have a massive rotator cuff tear, but the tendon uh, has mobility and you can reduce this anatomically, this is the way that I think is the better to fix this kind of tendon. A double row repair with transosseal equivalent using medial knot anchors and lateral and not less anchors to do that. And that's another case, a patient a little bit more younger than the first is only 49 years old, male, a company manager, no physical activity, fall down three years ago with trauma in the right shoulder, a progressive pain in these three years of trauma. And now we have a lot of pain during the night, during the night, during sleep, and a, pro a progressive pain during daily activities. The uh, physical examination is quite near to the other patient, but this patient has a little bit best, better uh, activity motion in elevation, 100 degrees. And this is the X-ray from this patient. And this is the MRI from this patient. Look at that. There is a big, big supraspinatus lesion. The supraspinatus and the infraspinatus is completely, is completely detached from the bone. The, subscap the subscapularis is very good and lower part of the infraspinatus looking good too. You can see that some atrophy in the supraspinatus, a gutalier grau two to grau three. The upper part of the infraspinatus is bad, but the lower part is good. The, the teres minor is good too and the subscapular is very good. So in young patient with this massive lesion, I always try to do an arthroscopy to understand this lesion and try to fix it. If I can do that, I think the transfer tendon is a very good option for this case. So this the, the, the treatment, the lesion of this patient is a huge lesion from massive rotator cuff. Look that the biceps is exposed only the lower part of the infraspinatus is attached. I go inside the lesion. The upper part is very, very big lesion. So with a grasper, I try to understand the mobility of this tendon. And look that. I can't put this tendon in the anatomic way. I can't do that. If I put in the anatomic great tuberosity part, I will create a very tension tendon, and I don't want to do that. Now I'm using an a, a instrument. I'm cleaning the bursa in the upper part of the rotator cuff, going to the lateral portal and now going to the posterior portal to, 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 to make free the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus to improve the mobility of the stand. After cleaning the upper part, look for the infraspinatus go a little bit better to the great tuberosity. But when I test the supraspinatus, uh, this lesion is still a uh, uh, attention to go to the great tuberosity. Look at that, I can't put it in the great tuberosity. Now I open the rotator cuff interval to improve the supraspinatus mobility. You need to do your best. You need to do everything you can do for this patient. And now I test and the supraspinatus come a little bit better, but I can't reduce that in the anatomic size. So I go to repair a medialization repair, and I would like to use the long head of the biceps like a reforce of this repair. Now I'm opening the, the biceps groove, and I'm testing to put the, great, the, 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 the long head of the biceps a little bit posterior in the center of the great tuberosity to create just like a ligament in the upper part of the, the, the articulation and improve, reforce the uh, re, the fixation of the, the rotator cuff. I made uh, a, a bone uh, uh, footprint, prepared the footprint, 
and now I'm passing two sutures in a loop way to use. In this case, I only have knotless anchors, so I use a knotless anchor to fix the long head of the biceps. The middle, the middle of the, the great tuberosity to create this upper ligament. This fixation of the long head of the biceps, the tenodesis of long head of the biceps is good when you use this looping. And this is the position of the new position of the biceps. Now, using the same sutures that I pass it through the biceps, I will pass through the anterior part of the supraspinatus in a Mason Allen way, a metro suture with a regular one. This I use to uh, improve the fixation of the rotator cuff and to mobilize to pass the other sutures. In this case, I can't do a double row repair because if I do that, I will improve the, the, the fixation, it will be too strong and the tension of this repair uh, will fail you. The, the repair. Now I'm trying to do a medial roll, a, me, a single roll using a speed fix rip stop way, using a mattress sutures and a loop suture and fix the first anchor in the posterior part of the supraspinatus and anterior part of the infraspinatus. And then I use another anchor in the lower part of the infraspinatus in the same way, a speed fix rip stop fixation. This kind of fixation, this is the end of the fixation after suturing, suture the knots of anterior parts. And I can recover the, the humeral head without tension from this uh, rotator cuff. So I believe that this way of fixation is good. In some cases, it's a, 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 it's a try to do this repair and the patient was very good. So, the medialization of the, the rotator curve, it's good. Can you do that? In this study from 2018, showing that if you, if you medialize uh, uh, one, one centimeter, you don't have a lot of trouble about that. You can maintain the force and maintain the mobility of this shoulder. Uh, 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 the, can we try, or it's good to try a primary repair from this massive rotator curve, this study from 2020 uh, showed for us that yes, you need to try because you can uh, 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 do the, the, the fixation. If you can do a complete or a partial fixation, a partial repair, you can improve the pain uh, and the function of this patient. But you need, you must talk with the patient that you have a higher. Uh, uh, rates of repair in this case of lesion. This is a study that showed for us, uh, showed for you uh, the, uh, the, the technique that I used to posterize the long head of the biceps to create a reforce, like, just like a ligament in the upper part of the, the shoulder, uh, make the function like a, reconst a capsular reconstruction, and you can medialize the suture and you improve this fixation, and the result was very good. This is another study from 2021. It's a recent one, it's June, uh, last June, uh, showing the same way, open the groove of the, rotator, the, the long head of the biceps and medialize him to fix the rotator curve with very good results too. So for me, you must do your best. You must understand the lesion, and you must talk with the patient the good and the bad results. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, my dear friend, Dr. Raffaele, for this very interesting talk. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have questions to uh, Dr. Raffaele. Thank you, Dr. Raffaele, for the lovely talk. You made the complex topic looks uh, easy. And uh, <laughs> uh, one question, when will you consider augmenting? Uh, do you do uh, augmenting massive tears? I, I, I totally agree with the double row and the evidences. Uh, very solid in that regard. But when would you consider uh, doing augmentation? Or is there any indication uh, in your mind? 
I think I think the augmentation is part of the future of the treatment of the rotator cuff, the massive rotator cuff tear, because you can improve the quality of your repair. Here in Brazil, we have a lot of pro uh, problems because we don't have this patch to do the augmentation. Mm. We still not have. Mm -hmm. Smith and nephew is trying to bring here to Brazil the Regenatin uh, patch to use that, just like you showed for us. I really think that when I, I have this patch, I will, I will use that. I will do the double row repair using this patch in the upper part of the rotator cuff to improve, to create some uh, biology to improve my, uh, my fixation. And if you can do a medialization of this tendon, I can use the patch too to create uh, uh, in the upper part of the rotator cuff, fixing the patch in the rotator cuff and in the bone to, to create a, 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 a repair just like a normal site of the rotator cuff. I really agree with you. The patch is a reality. The patch is good, but unfortunately, I don't have it in Brazil yet. I mm -hmm. only use that in USA when I perform my course over there, but here in Brazil, we still not have it. Thank you very much for the lovely talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Raffaelli. It's an honor to join us tonight. You are muted. No, no. Dr. Mohamed is muted. Thank you, thank you. Yes. First, I'd like to uh, express my deep thanks about this wonderful talk. And uh, my question is about using the long head of biceps. After you fix the long head of biceps, uh, and the greater two prostate, you would you like to tantamize the remaining bar to uh, decrease the pain or, or, or you don't do this? Uh, I, I learned this technique with Dr. Larry Field from USA. Uh, that's when I saw that uh, a couple of years ago, that's my question too. Uh, this patient will have pain in the long head of the biceps because you do another tenodesis and it's improved the, the force in this tenodesis. And he talked with me that we don't need to cut the, 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 the tendon. You only need to fix it. In my first case, I do double fixation for the longer head of the biceps, a little bit lower to the less to, to the great tuberosity and in the upper part to create this ligament. And then I cut in the middle. The patient don't have pain. And then I start to do only one fixation in the great tuberosity and believe in me, the patient don't have pain because when you fix this tendon, you have a good fixation, you transfer this fixation in the tenodesis so that the tension don't go interarticular in the, in the size that you create a new ligament. So you have two points of fixation, bone fixation, you create a new ligament. The tension go only for the lateral part of the biceps and you don't have more the, the killer angle. You have a, a, a biceps only uh, straight. So the patient don't have pain. I don't cut the biceps. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our next speaker will be a professor Muhammad Salah Sharaf from Banha University, speaking from uh, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Muhammad, you are ready? Yes, please. Okay, uh, very proud to talk uh, and to share in this uh, wonderful course. Uh, and after uh, these talks uh, from Dr. Imam, from Dr. Taha, from Dr. Uh, Raffaelli, we will talk uh, about uh, these talks were directed to specialized shoulder surgeon actually. So I will uh, take a small uh, light subject directed mainly to our uh, junior colleagues. We'll talk today about proximal humeral fractures uh, when I was uh, during my residency program, we used to manage all these fractures and most of shoulder uh, problems by just a sling. And uh, reviewing the uh, recent literature, uh, now there is a trend back to the sling again. And uh, there is a lot of uh, news and a lot of uh, studies uh, showing that there is this, the surgery is no better than a simple sling for displaced fracture of the uh, proximal humerus. So the objective of this talk is to overview the proximal humerus uh, fracture instance, classification treatment options, and spotlight on decision-making and management of proximal humeral fractures, and uh, have some 
uh, overview over the evidence-based outcome of fixation and arthroplasty following proximal humeral fractures. Uh, the proximal humeral fracture represent the third most frequent fracture in elderly patients after distal radius and fracture around the hips. Uh, there is a female to male ratio about uh, three to one. Uh, reviewing uh, the anatomy of the proximal humerus, we all uh, know that the proximal humerus is composed of a head covered by articular cartilage, greater or lesser tuberosity. The anatomic neck is this region below the humeral articular surface. Surgical neck is uh, the region below the tuberosities. There is uh, an inclination of the humeral head relative to the shaft for an average of 130 degrees and a retroversion of about 20 degrees. Uh, these are the four main parts uh, as described by Codman. Uh, this is uh, the articular surface. It has no attachment. Uh, this is the lesser tuberosity it's attached to uh, the subscapularis and the forces acting on this is displacing it medially. This is the greater tuberosity attached to the rotator cuff, usually displaced posteriorly and superiorly, and the shaft part is usually displaced superiorly and medially by the big major. Regarding uh, the main vascular arterial supply of the humeral head, it arises from the anterior humeral circumflex artery and that give rise to ascending branch and an arcuate artery, which is and end artery because of the close proximity of uh, these vessels to uh, the surgical neck of the humerus uh, there is high risk of uh, avascular necrosis uh, after these complex fractures uh, this is a mechanism of injury for older patients it's bimodal for older injured, for older patients it's usually low energy uh, falls from standing and for young patients, usually high energy trauma may be associated with dislocations. Uh, as regard classification, we still, uh, most shoulder surgeons still use near classification, popularized in 1970, is based on Codman four parts uh, fragments. Uh, it includes 16 variants, uh, all fractures with displacement less than one centimeter, with the exception of greater tuberosity, five millimeter, and an angulation of below 45 degrees are classified together as group one, which is minimally displaced fracture. Then the other groups are determined by the number of fracture fragments involved uh, with uh, a combination. As you can see, this is two part fracture. It can be surgical neck fracture. It can be greater, lesser tuberosity, three part fracture, four part fracture. Each of these could be associated with dislocation, either anterior or posterior. This is the AO classification. Less commonly used, type A is an extra-articular unifocal fracture, type B is a bifocal extra-articular fracture, and type C is an articular fracture uh, uh, and fracture dislocation. Uh, clinical evaluation, there is usually a swelling and pain. Sometimes there is no uh, swelling and ecchymosis appear in the uh, elbow region after a few days. Neurovascular evaluation is very important because of the very commonly affected axillary nerve injury in these cases up to 50 or 56 percent according to some studies x-rays you should as usual take at least two views perpendicular to each other ab view and the scapular plane and y scapular view of course this axillary view is very difficult in acute trauma settings so velbo view is used instead CT scan is very helpful in evaluating the degree of fracture displacement, especially in greater tuberosity fracture, and evaluating affection of the head, either head splits or impression fracture of the head and degree and the size of the split, and to uh, evaluate associated glenoid lesions, which may occur in these, especially in old osteoporotic patients. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting uh, and uh, very famous study uh, published by Hertel et al. It predict the head ischemia after uh, fracture of proximal humerus. They have done a prospective study included 100 consecutive uh, fractures. Uh, they assess the humeral head perfusion intraoperatively after pair holing and uh, in, the, in the whole number of patients and they used a laser Doppler flowmetry in 46 patients. They found that the predictors uh, of the uh, 
uh, avascular necrosis are the first and most relevant predictor was the metaphyseal head extension less than eight millimeter. This is the metaphyseal extension part of the head. If it is less than eight millimeters, so there is high risk of uh, AVN. The other predictor is loss of integrity of the medial hinge. And the uh, last one is the fracture pattern with the affection of the anatomical neck increase the risk of a vascular necrosis and ischemia. And with the more complex fractures and displacement of fragment, the uh, risk increase. Combining all these factors together, increase the risk of AVN to up to 98%. So regarding the treatment options, it's either conservative or surgical. Surgical include fixation, can use different tools of fixation from heavy sutures to wires either percutaneous, intramedullary nails are used and the most commonly used fixation is uh, the locked plates. Arthroplasty is another option uh, surgical option for management of complex proximal humeral fracture, especially in elderly or with affection of the head. Uh, regarding factors affecting decision making, we should look to patient factors. Patient age is very important in decision making, functional demand of the patient, hand dominance, and associated comorbidities. Other factors are related to the fracture, include fracture type, classification, and local bone quality and osteoporosis at the fracture site. The other are the facilities and surgical skills of the treating physician and institute. Uh, so what are the uh, indication for conservative treatment? The first indication is minimally displaced type one near uh, fracture. The other indication is two-part fracture that are displaced less than one centimeter or could be reduced to an acceptable position. The last indication for conservative treatment is a valgus impacted three and four part fractures in an elderly patient. Methods of conservative treatment are usually slang for two, maximum three weeks, followed by progressive rehabilitation to decrease the uh, stiffness and to improve the outcome. Uh, hanging cast was used in the past, but recent studies show that uh, it offers no advantage than slang and it may result in uh, non-union. So when to consider uh, fixation? If displaced greater to prostate fracture more than five millimeters, you can measure it uh, accurately on the CT, axial view, or if you have a lesser to prostate fracture with involvement of part of the head, or if you have displaced unstable surgical neck fracture or three or four part fractures. Uh, surgical options include, as we, uh, as we uh, told before, the percutaneous spinning. This is, uh, it has a very limited role actually. It's ideal for two and three part fractures where a close reduction can be obtained but required uh, additional fixation to, uh, to uh, allow early mobilization and in some valgus impacted four part fractures in elderly. However, uh, there is some rules. It should be patient must have good bone stock to ensure secure fixation. Displaced the greater fibrosity fragment should be large enough and the intact medial calcar region is very important for stability. So uh, in this technique, we use two to three retrograde bends placed from the shaft to the head and one or two uh, screws or wires uh, placed from the greater tuberosity. Classically, these wires should be serrated to avoid migration, either interarticular or in the chest. And there is high possibility of injury uh, of the axillary nerve if you didn't uh, put the uh, lateral wires far away from the uh, greater tuberosity and if you didn't take care about this uh, medial wire. Complications, risk of injury of axillary nerve with lateral bends along the head of biceps with the anterior bends, loss of reduction and possible bend migration. That's why a lot of uh, linkage devices are used to prevent uh, migration of these wires. Uh, fixation, we used usually the deltovectoral approach, but we can use transdeltoid approach. Usually these buttress plates are 
not used today. What we are using now are these locked blades with the advantage of fixed angle blades. It has good head fixation, adequate number of screws in the head. It has holes for suture fixation of the tuberosity, which is the most important uh, part of the fixation. Uh, the technique include taking the tuberosities, the greater and lesser tuberosities with heavy non-absorbable suture materials, and uh, then you reduce the head fragment and restore the medial calcar. You can use bone graft, either strut graft or allograft, if you have a defect here. Then you close the bone, close the tuberosities together, and of course you can use some uh, percutaneous wires to maintain temporary fixation until you put the blade just lateral to uh, the biceptal groove. As we see, uh, the blade is not a reduction tool in this uh, maneuver. It, you have to reduce first, then you have, then you can fix. Uh, this is a four-part fracture fixed with filous place, and you can see here the holes of the transosseous sutures that are secured to the blade. Restoration of the medial calcar support and the inferior calcar screw is very important to avoid uh, loss of reduction. So in this case, it's better to put uh, an inferior calcar screw here to maintain the reduction and to avoid uh, very small uh, position. Uh, this is a MIBO technique. We can use the plate here as a reduction tool in some cases of valgus impacted fracture where the medial calcar can be uh, restored. Nails are not used frequently, usually used in two-part fracture in a little younger uh, patients. However, it has complication of violating the cuff and it is less stable, especially in rotational forces. Complication of plate include screw cut out and penetration. And this is very, very common complication of plates. And uh, this is usually occur with virus collapse and a vascular necrosis. If you can see in both cases, there is no inferior calcar screw and there is no restoration of the medial calcar. Uh, and this is the main cause of virus collapse and failure of uh, filo splits. This is a, a very uh, nice study, a long-term observational study that conducted to analyze the instance of complications and revision surgeries after locked plate. They have included 788 patients, and uh, the results show that there is decreased complication late in the last five years. Complications used to be about 40, 50 percent, 14 to 15 percent. It's now about five percent only. And they analyze the result and conclude that these decrease in complication are due to the use of uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty in complex cases that was uh, misused by plates before and by uh, using the uh, calcar screw and uh, adequate technique for plating. This is another study uh, to show the importance of inferior calcar screw and restoring the medial calcar uh, to prevent various collapse. And in this study, the most common causes of failure are loss of uh, Loss of, uh, loss of frustration, lack of frustration of the calcar, loss of inferior calcar screw and uh, cross-threading of the screws. If you can see the screws here, it's loose, not locked into the plate. So when to consider uh, arthroplasty? Usually consider arthroplasty and non-reconstructable articular surface fracture, head split fractures, complex four part fracture in relatively young and middle-aged patients and in severely displaced three and four part fractures with loss of medial hinge and osteoporosis. Uh, of course, we used to uh, use hemi, fracture hemi arthroplasty. Uh, it result in good bone relief, pain relief, but uh, unfortunately it has limited function. Restoring the humeral height is very tricky and very important uh, in these cases and restoring the tuberosities and fixing the tuberosities either together and or to the shaft is very important uh, predictor fi predictable factor for uh, a good outcome. Uh, 
the increased trend now are to use a reverse shoulder arthroplasty in uh, complex fracture especially in elderly patient over 65 or 70 years old and there is this is there is a lot of studies suggesting a better outcome uh, of reverse over uh, the uh, hemiarthroplasty this is a very recent uh, a very recent randomized uh, controlled study multicentric that uh, find that there is a better result of uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty over uh, fracture hemi Um, so, uh, if you are going to use a uh, reverse shoulder, should we use it acutely after fracture or should we give the patient some time to be managed conservatively? This is a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, included 16 study, uh, which compromised 322 patients undergoing reverse to uh, total shoulder uh, for a fracture sequelae, they conclude that there is no difference in forward deflection, clinical outcome scores, and reoperation rate, uh, either to use uh, between the both groups, the group who used acute and the delayed reverse shoulder. So they conclude that given the risk associated with surgery in the elderly population, consideration may be given to initial trial of non-operative treatment in this patient, saving reverse total shoulder arthroplasty for those in whom non-operative treatment fail without compromising the ultimate outcome. However, another large uh, study uh, included 4,245 uh, patients with acute uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty and around 1,000 in delayed primary uh, arthroplasty uh, identified in the uh, US insurance database between 2005 and 2014, so that delayed primary uh, reverse was associated with higher short-term one-year rate of revision and dislocation compared to uh, acute primary. So does the surgery yield a better result than conservative treatment? There is a lot of studies that show that uh, there is no difference between surgical and non-surgical treatment of the spilized fracture proximal humerus. This is a very important uh, multi-center randomized control trial. They recruited 250 patients with a mean age of 66 years and patients were randomized into either operative management, either fixation or arthroplasty and conservative treatment. And at three years follow-up, they find no difference in both groups. At two years follow-up, they find no difference at both groups the group who were managed conservatively and who were managed surgically. The same group after three years have done uh, the result extended follow-up up to four, five years and they still have no significant difference in patient reported outcome between operative and non-operative treatment. Uh, this is another uh, meta-analysis showing operative versus non-operative management. It included 22 studies compromising seven randomized controlled trials and 15 observational study. Uh, all over all 1,743 patients, the average age was 68 and 75% of patients were women. There was no difference in functional outcome between operative and non-operative. So, there is a lot of evidence that there is no difference between operative and non-operative management. So now that mean, what does this mean? This means that we can go back to the sling. There is no benefit of surgeries. I don't think so, but I think uh, the proper assessment of the patient and the fracture, fracture morphology type, proper selection of the patient and selection of the management plan will improve the outcome. I think proper surgical technique in plating and arthroplasty result in less complications and failure rates and improve outcome. I think management of complex proximal humerus fractures should be operated in specialized upper limb units. Conservative treatment is still an option in displaced proximal humeral fraction in elderly, especially with uh, lack of experience in uh, operating uh, complex 
uh, arthroplasty surgeries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mohammed Salah, for this very comprehensive presentation. Thank you so much. If we have any questions to Professor Mohammed. Okay, we will move to the uh, next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. The next speaker will be Professor Amr Rashwan from Cairo University. Professor Amr? Dr. Mohammed, how are you? How are بي على دعوة كريمة دي على شكل مشاركة في كورس بتاع جامعة بنها يعني سوكسي عالمي جدا 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 ناس كثير أعرفها في الخليج وفي في الدول الأوروبية كمان بيتابعوه فأشكره على إتاحته الفرصة دي لي علشان أشارك مع حضراتكم في الكورس ده أنا هتكلم على الأكروميو كلافيكلر جوينت إنجريز Um, the optimal treatment of acromic is still controversial. For many years, the main concern was to restore the coracoclavicular ligament complex. But recently, the research interest had aroused towards the acromioclavicular uh, joint capsule and ligament importance. As we can see here, uh, regarding the anatomy of the acromioclavicular joint, it is a diarthroidal joint between the lateral end of the clavicle and the medial end of uh, the acromion, uh, supported by uh, the uh, acromioclavicular capsule with its condensation forming the acromioclavicular ligaments with the coracoclavicular ligaments, namely the conoid and trapezoid. As we can see here, uh, this is the uh, trapezoid ligament passing posterolateral, and this is the conoid ligament passing anteromedial, uh, being uh, a three cent one and a half centimeter from the lateral end of the clavicle and the conoid about two and a half centimeter from uh, uh, the uh, lateral end of the clavicle. Together, the coracoclavicular uh, uh, ligaments with the acromioclavicular joint capsule and its condensation from the ligaments form part of the superior shoulder suspensory mechanism, which is responsible for the stability of uh, the uh, shoulder joint. Uh, this is a cadaveric dissection showing the uh, acromioclavicular capsule, which is responsible for the anteroposterior or the horizontal stability of the joint, allowing for uh, the rotation and the gliding, as well as uh, allowing for the uh, retraction and protraction of uh, the scapula. The acromioclavicular ligaments is formed of two bundles, mainly the superior posterior bundle and the anterior inferior bundle. Uh, the main function for the acromioclavicular ligaments is uh, to provide the horizontal stability, mainly the, an namely the anteroposterior translation of uh, the acromioclavicular joint. And also it is a restraint against the posterior axial rotation of the clavicle. Usually the acromioclavicular ligaments fail at first. Uh, they, uh, they, the, their injury occurs uh, during the acromioclavicular dislocation uh, prior to the, uh, the rupture of the coracoclavicular ligament. The coracoclavicular complex, as we have said, it is composed of it, the anteromedial and the trapezoid, the posterolateral component, which is the stronger of the two ligaments. Uh, their main function is uh, to provide the vertical stability, mainly the uh, superior inferior translation of the acromioclavicular joint, as well as they provide a rotational stability and the stability with the protraction and retraction of the clavicle. And as we had said, they are more stronger than the acromioclavicular ligaments. And so their failure is uh, on the second step of the failure of the joint. This is the normal coracoclavicular distance, and this is the, the space where the coracoclavicular ligaments exist. And this is very important uh, during uh, the assessment of the patient with a suspected coracoclavicular joint. This uh, 
distance is extending from the superior cortical aspect of the coracoid process to the inferior cortical aspect of the lateral end of the clavicle. Uh, Rockwood had classified the acromioclavicular dislocation into six uh, main types. In the first one, there is um, a sprain or a partial rupture of the acromioclavicular ligaments. And then uh, the conoid and trapezoid are just sprained and they are intact with no radiographic uh, displacement. Then in type two, there is a, a, a partial, uh, there is a tear of the acromioclavicular ligaments together with uh, a sprain or a partial rupture of the conoid and trapezoid with a very minimal uh, radiological displacement. But in type three, there is a frank rupture of the acromioclavicular ligaments as well as the coracoclavicular ligaments with a, a, a marked radiological uh, displacement. Uh, type three is a very debatable as we will discuss later. Uh, with the uh, ISACUS uh, consensus group around about the uh, acromioclavicular joint uh, injuries, they subdivided type 3 into type 3A, which is stable, and type 3B, which is unstable. Then we go for uh, type 4, in which there is a, a rupture of the coraco, uh, acromioclavicular ligaments as well as the uh, uh, coracoclavicular ligaments but with a posterior translation of the lateral end of the clavicle into the trapezius. Type five, there is complete rupture with a more uh, uh, superior inferior or vertical displacement with more widening of the uh, coracoclavicular uh, distance. And finally, type six, which is a very rare entity in which the clavicle will dislocate uh, uh, under uh, the uh, coracoid process whether to be subacromial or subcoracoid and beyond the conjoint tendon. As we can see here, this is the X-ray and very evident uh, on uh, the uh, uh, anteroposterior or uh, uh, Zanka views uh, that there is a, a marked disruption of the uh, acromioclavicular joint. Uh, the CT with 3D is very important and is very beneficial because it could provide you uh, uh, with the information about the uh, presence or the absence of a fracture of the coracoid brace, which is the main station in the treatment of the acromioclavicular ligaments, whether uh, doing tunnels through uh, the coracoid base or uh, performing uh, loops around the coracoid base uh, for the biological grafts. So a CT with 3D, um, I think it is mandatory. Uh, to uh, confirm the, uh, that the coracoid is intact. As we can see here in this paper, this is a case report in the American Journal of Sports Medicine about the presence of a coracoid fracture in patients with an acromioclavicular joint separation in an American football player. So um, most probably we will need to do a CT with 3D in patients with acromioclavicular uh, joint disruption uh, to confirm uh, that the coracoid process is intact. As we can see here, this is the mechanism uh, of uh, the acromioclavicular joint uh, disruption, whether uh, through a direct trauma to the lateral end of uh, the clavicle uh, or an indirect trauma as falling on an outstretched hand or on the point of the shoulder. This is the picture uh, of the injury of our famous player, Mohamed Salah. Uh, he had a grade uh, two or grade three acromioclavicular joint disruption during the final match between Real Madrid and Liverpool. As we can see here in the radiological evaluation, uh, the anteroposterior Zanka views uh, are very important to uh, compare the coracoclavicular uh, distance on the uh, both sides uh, with uh, more apparent on the left side the injury and as we can see here in type 5 the displacement is about uh, three times the normal coracoclavicular ligaments and here in type 3b as we had said as classified by Isakos uh, there is a posterior displacement of the lateral end of the clavicle uh, posteriorly, which means that there is a dynamic horizontal instability affecting the acromioclavicular joint. 
as we have said, type three injuries, this is uh, a controversial uh, issue about the management uh, divided according to the ISTACUS consensus group uh, into a stable type A and unstable type B. There is a debate of whether conservative or operative, uh, the dynamic instability is an important issue. Whether it is an acute or chronic, the acute is better than the chronic regarding the operative treatment and also the occupation of the patient, whether he is a military personnel or an athletic population, because in these patients, any dynamic instability will affect the performance and consequently, they need to go for an operative treatment, as we had said, uh, going acutely from the start and not to wait the, to be a chronic injury. Uh, this is the full chart of the management of uh, the acromioclavicular joint uh, injuries. As we can see here, uh, the ROCO type 1 and type 2, uh, the main primary management is non-operative. Type 3 uh, ROCO uh, injury, uh, we will see whether he is an athlete, he is a military personnel, or he is a high demand uh, or a manual worker. If uh, he is one of this um, group of patients, then we will go for a primary operative management. If he is not among this group, then we will go for a non-operative treatment for six to 12 weeks. If it is successful, then he will return to, to activity. If it is not successful, then we will go for a secondary operative treatment. Regarding type four, five, and six, they, they will go from the start towards a primary operative management. The management consideration of the acromioclavicular joint timing of surgery. Uh, we classify uh, the acromioclavicular joint injuries into an acute injury if it is less than three weeks. And why less than three weeks? Because this is uh, the time required for the uh, acromioclavicular and coracoclavicular joint uh, ligaments to heal. And whether it is a chronic injury more than six weeks, and this is debatable because some pay, some um, uh, literature uh, reviews uh, consider the chronic injury beyond three months. But uh, in the systematic reviews uh, on the acromioclavicular joint injuries, the early surgery is better than the delayed one because it takes the potential for healing of the native coraco uh, clavicular ligaments and the acromioclavicular ligaments. In the acromioclavicular uh, injuries in the acute cases, the main aim is to approximate the ends of the acromioclavicular and coracoclavicular ligaments in order to achieve healing, while in the chronic cases, the uh, aim is to reconstruct the uh, injured ligaments and just the mechanical stabilization alone of the dislocated joint will not offer a sufficient power to resist the future loads on such an important joint. And consequently, the use of biological augmentation with uh, grafts, whether uh, autograft, whether allograft, or whether synthetic graft uh, should be considered to augment uh, their uh, reconstruction in the chronic cases. Regarding the management of the acute acromioclavicular injuries, the main aim is fixation to approximate, as we had said, the uh, coracoclavicular ligaments and acromioclavicular ligaments to achieve healing. This could be achieved through suture tapes, anchors, hooked plate, but the hooked plates need a second operation for removal, whether uh, a coracoclavicular screw, Bussler screw, but this needs a second operation. And there is um, many reports about complication and failure in the literature. The use of a cortical flip button, like the dog bone, together with a biological augmentation with uh, semitendinosus or gracilis or paramelis longus tendons, through an arthroscopic procedure. This could provide the patient with a high uh, shoulder score uh, regarding the clinical and functional outcome or fixation with the K-wires. These are the different modalities. This is the booth versus who. This is the hook the plate, but it needs removal to avoid the subacromial impingement and its erosion on the undersurface of the acromion, which could lead to a fracture of the acromion, especially in patients with thin acromion. Uh, this is the K-wire fixation, but there is a high possibility of migration and failure. And this is the uh, suspension uh, fixation systems. 
If we go for the chronic acromioclavicular injuries, as we had said, we need a ligament reconstruction of the injured ligaments beyond six weeks. This could be achieved through uh, many surgical procedures. One of them is the modified weaver done in which there is a distal lateral and clavicle excision together with the uh, harvesting of uh, the uh, coraco acromial ligament uh, and passing it together with a pony chip into the distal end of the clavicle to recreate the coraco clavicular ligaments or the use of an autograft, namely the uh, semitendinosus, the gracilis, the palmaris longus, uh, the peroneus longus, or use an allograft. And both of these techniques are biological with an aim to uh, provide a better stability for the uh, joint, uh, but uh, it is uh, better than the synthetic uh, grafts. The synthetic grafts, mainly the Lars and the Dacron uh, grafts, uh, they uh, induce a foreign body reaction, uh, some uh, persistent inflammation and diffusion in the joint, but they are uh, to be considered if the autografts or the allografts are not available. And finally, um, a new technique, which is a dynamic fixation using the conjoint tendon, namely the short head of uh, the biceps uh, as a suspension to the undersurface of uh, the uh, clavicle, lateral end of the clavicle, to imitate the uh, coraco clavicular ligaments uh, as a new technique. Here is the harvesting of the coraco uh, acromial ligament. And this is the resection of the lateral end of uh, the clavicle. And here is harvesting of the coraco acromial ligament together with a bone chip from the lateral end of the chromium and then passing the coraco acromial ligament into the opened lateral end of the clavicle using sutures or suture tips. The main drawbacks of the modified we were done is that the coracoacromial ligament harvested is having nearly 25% of the native power of the uh, coraco uh, clavicular ligaments. The coracoacromial ligament mainly is a part of the coracoacromial arch, and it is a static restraint against the anterosuperior migration of the humeral head, especially in patients with a massive rotator cuff tears. So if we harvest the uh, coraco uh, acromion ligament uh, in patients with massive rotator cuff tears, this will allow for an anterosuperior escape of the humeral head. And finally, the vector or the line of pull of the transferred coraco acromion ligament does not co coincide with the vector of the native coraco clavicular ligaments. This is a case presentation. This is the clavicle with uh, the two tunnels preferred. And this is a harvested uh, semitendinosus. And here, passing the semitendinosus graft around the coracoid process and passing them through uh, the bony tunnels into the lateral end of the clavicle and tying them together and then using the ex excessive lens to uh, reconstruct the acromioclavicular ligaments across the the uh, acromioclavicular uh, joint space and then resuture it on itself so we are we have reconstructed the coracoclavicular as well as the acromioclavicular ligaments um, as we had said uh, the main trend is towards the arthroscopic surgery today using the suspensory devices with or without a tendon graft uh, what are the main advantages of this technique? That there is no need for removal. Uh, using the arthroscope, we can address any associated pathology with the injury of the acromioclavicular joint, as well as it offers the patient a very uh, excellent uh, scores regarding the functional outcome. However, the drilling through the clavicle and then through the coracoid carries the risk of the fracture of the clavicle or the coracoid as well as the risk of uh, tunnel dilatation through the, um, the movement of the suspensory system. Uh, the use of uh, or the combination with a biological component through the use of a palmaris longus, a semitendinosus, or a gracilis tendon, or a peroneus longus tendon, uh, being uh, uh, looped around the coracoid and then 
uh, looped around the uh, clavicle could provide a more stronger uh, fixation for such a system without the risk of uh, drilling through the clavicle uh, using the tunnels. Here I will be presenting a case of a chromoclavicular joint dislocation. This is the preparation of the undersurface of the coracoid. We are viewing through an anterior anterolateral portal. And this is the radio frequency removing uh, the preosteum from the undersurface of the clavicle till exposing the base of the coracoid process and using the shaver to properly expose the undersurface properly. Here is the undersurface of the coracoid process being exposed. And then the introduction of the guide for the reconstruction. Here is the guide for the acromioclavicular joint. And then drilling, as we can see here, the wire had passed through the base of the coracoid process. Then through the anterolateral portal, we can confirm the exact position of the drill tunnel at the base of the coracoid process. This is the cannulated reamer. And then we pass through the cannulated reamer, the nitinol wire, flexible wire, to be uh, retrieved through uh, the anterior portal because it will be used to shuttle uh, the uh, suspension system. Here we are passing the suspension system and here it is flipped on the undersurface of the coracoid base. We make sure that it is properly fixed on the undersurface of the uh, coracoid and here the sutures are being tightened working on the clavicular side above and here is finally we will retrieve uh, the passing sutures which had guided the button through uh, the tunnel to the clavicle then through the coracoid base Here is the button properly fixed on the undersurface. This are an intra uh, operative C arm uh, views showing the uh, flip button on the undersurface of the coracoid and uh, the uh, suspension button on the upper surface of the lateral end of the clavicle. And this is the post operative x ray. And here is the passage. Sorry, I'm not. This is not working about passage of the biological augmentation. Another technique is to do uh, a circlage um, wiring or a circlage tape around the lateral end of uh, across the acromioclavicular joint uh, to augment uh, the suspension fixation by many uh, techniques using the tapes, using suture wires, or even using the biological graft and passing the extended length across a, a, a hole in uh, the uh, acromion and then resuture it back on uh, itself at uh, the posterior aspect of the clavicle, thus reconstructing the superior and posterior capsule, uh, capsular ligaments. This provide a, a better horizontal stability, uh, a better long-term results and better functional outcome. And uh, now uh, the more common techniques is uh, using a patch augmentation, whether with uh, dermal uh, xenografts or uh, dermal allografts uh, to reconstruct the uh, acromioclavicular uh, joint. 
with uh, uh, button stabilization. This is the literature review around uh, the use of uh, the uh, tight throw fixation uh, that it is much better than the hook plate fixation in the acute unstable acromioclavicular uh, joint dislocations. Uh, to summarize it up, uh, our take home message that uh, we uh, treating the, acrom the acute or chronic acromioclavicular injuries is a challenge to the orthopedic surgeon. Uh, we should take care of uh, the presence uh, of a coracoid fracture because it is the mainstay in the treatment of the acromioclavicular joint dislocation. And also, don't miss the lateral endoclavical fractures as an acromioclavicular as dislocations. Different modalities of acromioclavicular joint dislocation, uh, fixation, and reconstruction. Uh, many techniques um, try to uh, be familiar with most of these techniques, but there is no consensus about uh, the best technique or the best management of uh, such uh, a challenging type of injury. The arthroscopic uh, acromioclavicular reduction and fixation using the tight rope together with an augmentation with a biological graft is a very recent and effective modality for the acromioclavicular joint dislocation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Amrashwan, Cairo University, for this very interesting talk. If we have uh, questions to Professor Am, Dr. Raffaelli, I see you. Uh, do you want any questions? Okay, thank you so much. No, I, I really, I really think that Dr. Amrashwan did a fantastic presentation. It's uh, is a is a kind of pathology that we have a lot of doubts yet. Yeah. And this change of fixation in horizontal and vertical fixation to improve the, the stability of the acromioclavicular joint, for me, that's the, a very good way to, to treat this pathology. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rafael. Thank you for both all. Thank you so much. Uh, now we will move to the uh, final step in this uh, and this day, the, it, it's a recorded surgery offered by uh, Zemar Company. Uh, it will be uh, presented by uh, Professor Hossam El Bigawi. Professor Hossam will give a short note on the uh, recorded surgery, and then we will uh, move to the recorded uh, video. Professor Hossam? Uh, Dr. Amro, would you please stop by sharing screen, sir? Okay. Sorry. Uh, I think I stopped the share. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, you are ready with the video? Just one moment, we are preparing the video. Hello, Michael. Salam Fabriquet, Dr. Hussain. I'm asking for the video to be, uh, yes. Dr. Hussam, you are ready? Dr. Hussam?
يا دكتور حسام ايه انت ما تدخلش ليه؟ حبيب طيب اوكي حسام هيشغل فيديو دلوقتي اوكي ماشي يا حبيبي Sorry, just one moment. Fee technical problem, but still video fun. Can I do that on YouTube?
صوت شغال يا فندم؟ صوت الفيديو مش شغال يا دكتور حسام. كده يا فندم شغال؟ السلام عليكم. تمام طيب ركاز اتفضل. عايزين نتاكد بس ان الفيديو شغال لان انا جربته كان شغال كويس. كده يا فندم صوت واضح؟ لا دكتور حسام احنا ممكن نشغله وحضرتك تقول الكومنت اللي عليه يا فندم. السلام عليكم. اتفضل دكتور حسام. دكتور محمد احنا معلش انا اسف التكنيكال بوينتس ديت كان في مشكله في دكتور حسام صوت النت هنا سامعني كده يا دكتور محمد؟ كده سامع حضرتك اتفضل يا فندم لا الصوت مش واضح يا دكتور حسام خالص طب <تصفيق> طب اقفل يا فندم الشير واعمل في الشير تاني ثانية واحدة فندم كده عمرو يفتحه من عند اللاب بتاعه دلوقتي يا باشا ان شاء الله. اوكي. السلام عليكم. السلام عليكم يا دكتور حسام. محمد ازي حضرتك؟ يعني من حضرتك كل نهنئ حضرتك ونهنئ انفسنا بالنجاح بتاع الكورس وال وال والعمادة ومش عارفين ربنا يخليك يا حبيبي. ربنا يكرمك يا دكتور محمد. خليك يا حبيبي. هو الفيديو بتاعنا ده يعني مواجه اكتر لطلبه الماجستير والدكتوراه. المفروض ان هم يعرفوا لان هم بيمتحنوا الابروتشز بتاعت الشولدر والتكنيكال بوينتس فاحنا في كذا بوينت عايزين ان هم يعرفوها قبل ما ايه يعني ناخد بالنا منهم قبل ما ما نبدا الفيديو. أول حاجة الأبروتش اللاند ماركس والإنسيجن والديستريكشن واليوز أوف ريتراكتورز وبعد كده البروسيدور إزاي يظبط الأنتي فيرشن بتاع البروسيسز وإزاي هاو تو يوز ذا ترايلز اند بوست أوبراتيف ريهابيليتيشن فان الاسئله اللي في مصر تكون تكون عندهم اجابه لها فنبدا الفيديو واحنا ماشيين ان شاء الله هنبقى نتكلم عنها اتفضل يا حسين حسام عرفت شغال ولا لسه؟ لا ما فيش صوره يا حسام نعم لا بقول سوري بيقول لك حسام ال حسام الاكسيد عمرو ما فيش صوره في الفيديو
حسام الكسيري انت عندك تكنيكال بروبلم في الفيديو؟ اي فندم آه هو فندم دلوقتي عامل عامل رفعه من على اللاب بتاعه اه ممكن اصل انا شغلته كان شغال كويس ما فيش مشاكل يعني اه ولا طب طب حاضر يا فندم اشوف كده مع عمرو كده واتكلم حضرتك ثاني بقى على طول لو احنا عندنا تكنيكال بروبلم ممكن نخليه بكره ان شاء الله ما فيش مشكله يعني يو سولف ذا بروبلم ونكمله بكره ان شاء الله السكند دي تمام حاضر يا فندم ثانيه واحده كده شوف اللاست ترايل كده احنا بكرة ان شاء الله عندنا second day احنا معانا بكرة lots of eminent speakers معانا بروفيسور ماهر العسال من اسيوت يونيفرستي بروفيسور حاتم جلال زاكي من اسيوت يونيفرستي بروفيسور عبد الرحمن الجنايمي من المنصورة بروفيسور محمد صبحي من عين شمس بروفيسور معين خان من ماكماستر يونيفرستي كندا بروفيسور عمرو انديل من المنوفية ان شاء الله فانا هشوف بس الفيديو في بروبلم اي حسام عرفت تشغله ولا في بروبلم احنا بنعتذر لحضراتكم ان في تكنيكال بروبلم في الفيديو نفسه هينزل بكره ان شاء الله في السكند دي انا اسف دكتور حسام معلش هم مش عارفين يحملوه من الموقع نفسه فهينزلوه على الجهاز ويشتغل بكره ان شاء الله فاحنا بكره ان شاء الله هنبدا الداي 3 الظهر 3 بي ام لحد 7 مساء لحد 7 بي ام ان شاء الله هيبقى معانا 8 سبيكرز بكره ان شاء الله في الديفرنت انتيتيز لي والديفرنت توبكس في الشولدر سيرجري فنأسف على العطل ده وان شاء الله بكره الفيديو يتذاع ونرى حضراتكم بكره الساعه 3 العصر باذن الله تعالى. شكرا متشكرين يا فندم تصبحوا على الف خير. شكرا يا فندم. شكرا يا فندم 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 شكرا يا ف